Thanks for coming to the seminar this morning. Today we've got Dr. Megan Evans, a senior lecturer in the School of Business from the University of New South Wales in Canberra. And she'll be talking about Australia's nature positive and net zero journey so far. Just before I hand over to her, we've got new microphones in this room. So just make sure only one person is speaking at a time for the people on Zoom. Thanks, thanks so much, Hannah. Um, thanks very much for having me here today. Um, just want to acknowledge first I'm standing on the unceded lands of the Yagara and Turrbal people, and I acknowledge their uh, elders past and present. So um, this, I don't quite know if I'm standing. Here's, here's fine. Um, I know the camera kind of cuts out a little bit over there. Um, this is a little bit of a rant. I uh, was asked last year to kind of give a, a seminar on the view from Canberra, and which I guess means politics and policy because there's nothing else in Canberra. There is. I love Canberra. Um, uh, but I couldn't make that seminar, so I'm making it up for it today. And, um, yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit about the uh, current uh, nature positive or uh, the nature repair market bill that's currently being will be tabled in parliament soon uh and also a lot of climate stuff because we need to know about the climate stuff to see how it's informing the biodiversity stuff so uh, we'll get started so the full title of this talk is drawing on the work of john Cadelka, who's a cartoonist at the southern union um, and this is from his uh, Rusted on Tea Towel uh, called, uh, well, it's a bingo. So any kind of um, pop-out excuse that you hear about why we can't actually act on climate change is summarised in this tea towel. Um, and the one I'm going to focus on in particular is don't let the bare minimum be the enemy of the grossly inadequate, uh, which is a variation of uh, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, but that phrase becomes meaningless when the perfect is the bare minimum and the good that is being presented as a policy option is actually frankly disastrous. And that's the situation that we're in at the moment with uh, the safeguard mechanism policy that the government is trying to get through parliament again and the nature repair market bill that they're gonna to try to get through as quickly as possible um, very soon, because um, you know, if we're serious about climate change, we'll start now and gradually ramp up. We'll start from going backwards and then apparently we'll go back back up we'll, we'll improve things these are all things that i've heard i'm seeing in the news recently so i guess i'm drawing your attention to this to be aware of some of the discursive strategies that are used to uh, maintain the status quo so I'll be talking a bit about the nature of care bill as well as all of this other stuff, because I know that everyone here's focus is on biodiversity, but the playbook is being set in the climate domain. And if you read that, you can predict how things will go for biodiversity at the moment. So who's aware of the nature of care market bill? Hands up. Okay. All right. Um, so has anyone looked at the exposure draft? Martine. <laughs> yeah, Tash, good on you. See, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not a real nerd until you actually read a draft to become the exposure kit. Um, so what is it? Uh, this is the, the objects or the, this is part of the summary explanatory memorandum to encourage investment in biodiversity and to make it easier for businesses, organizers, et cetera, to invest in projects. Okay, note that the objective is to increase investment in biodiversity, which uh, fits within the current reframing of the biodiversity conservation problem at a global scale that's come from the UN, you know, started from in development, it's gone into climate. It's talking about this finance gap, this gap between what we're currently investing in biodiversity, climate development, and what we need. And the argument is that we need to close that finance gap by getting private finance in. And we need to encourage that private finance somehow. And the argument is that we need to make these things financially attractive to private investors. We need to make biodiversity conservation profitable. We need to make climate action profitable. We need to make economic development in uh, the global south profitable. Otherwise, we won't get that finance. 
so note that this is that's a different problem statement than saying we're wanting to you know uh, slow biodiversity loss and I'm teaching systems thinking and systems theory at the moment and so this is a classic kind of situation where the system goal of needing to conserve biodiversity is actually different to the goal of something here and once you have a misalignment in goals you're going to have you're not actually necessarily going to meet the broader goal we might get lots of finance but where's that going to go it might not necessarily uh, help biodiversity so four things, what is it? Why do we have this bill? Um, this is, um, uh, Martine called this her, her proudest joint work with me. Um, uh, uh, she was saying, you know, well, I need some kind of meme. So I'm in meme generator, you know, coming up with this thing. Nature positive is the new hot thing. Everyone wants it. And the old mitigation hierarchy that we've been talking about for a couple of decades, meh. We just need to go nature positive now. Whatever that is, it just sounds cool. Um, it's so cool that it's in the Australian Financial Review. Um, people in suits are talking about it, so it must be important. Please don't break that again. Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I know that you're trying to keep things working. Um, what does it mean? Well, E.J. miller Gulland, who was, I think, one of the came up with this term, she's already kind of said this term, which is actually meant to mean restoration of biodiversity by 2050. So we're currently losing it. We want to grow it and then actually have more by 2050. She's cautioned that it's already been diluted away from that original uh, uh, definition towards any action that sounds vaguely positive. So you can, be, you can try to be nature positive, but, you know, what does that actually mean? Uh, second reason why we need a market, um, it's really expensive <laughs> and, you know, we don't have enough money to save biodiversity, we don't have enough government public money, we don't pay enough tax maybe, um, because, you know, uh, we can't, governments alone can't shoulder the enormous cost of repairing Australia's environment because it might take a billion dollars a year. <laughs> A billion dollars a year down here. I've put I put I put two billion in here, just you know, to pad things out a little bit. That's how much it will cost to save all of our most threatened species, according to Brennan Wintles and Catch Kate and Ted's paper. How much do we spend on subsidizing climate change every year? Over ten billion dollars of our public money subsidizing fossil fuel extraction new fossil fuel developments, which IPCC says we cannot have if we are going to have an inhabitable planet. Stage three tax cuts benefit people like me and as well as the other 0.0 or 0.51% uh, helping me with my tax returns. So I have a bit more money in my, um, you know, I mean, six big salaries, yeah, but there's also people on you know, a lot more than that. Um, this is what I saw today, uh, based on, um, what's his name, Electrify Man, um, Saul Griffin. Uh, this is how much it could cost to get gas out of every Australian home, give everyone a $11,000 uh, EV subsidy. We'll still have some left over to completely get off gas, but we just bought some, eight, we bought eight submarines that we'll get in 2030. So don't tell me we don't, we can't afford it. We can afford it if we really want it. Um, third reason, uh, we had something in the trash that we pulled out. That's actually called the garbage can model of policy making. Um, uh, Minister Little Crowd came up with a agricultural stewardship plan, which was a copy and paste of the, uh, well, the scheme wasn't a copy and paste, but there was a, bill put in Parliament last time, that was a copy and paste of the Carbon Farming Initiative Act. And now the current government's taken that bill, tweaked a few words and called it a nature repair market, but they've totally expanded the scope to be a green Wall Street rather than a relatively small scale thing that will help some farmers doing some small scale stuff. So control C, control B. Fourth reason. We can grow the economy and save biodiversity too. Actually, no, you can't do that. That won't work. 
what message would you prefer to hear? Okay, um, this is what's happened. But, and this is all behind the scenes, not in the public domain. This is how political influence uh, comes up with stuff like this. In the last six months, mostly in the last three months, these are the number of reports come out advocating the use of quote unquote voluntary biodiversity credit slash certificates as a way of unlocking private finance to fund uh, nature conservation. Anyone seen of these before? Martin, Tash. This is all happening under our noses. We are not involved in this debate. I've been involved, you know, I've been doing a DECA for the last three years. I have not had time to read a single one of these things, but this is driving the policy agenda and our community is not involved. And that's frankly, partly on purpose. Here's one from the World Economic Forum, trying to say, well, credits are very, very different to offsets. Offsets, ooh, bad, we know they don't, but people don't like them. They may look similar in design, but how they differ in how people intend to use them. They are, a credit is used to be part of a company's nature positive journey rather than compensating or offsetting damage. What does that mean? Does anyone make that make sense? Here's one, I had an interaction with someone on LinkedIn last night because unfortunately at the moment I'm spending a lot of time on LinkedIn. I blanked out the names, so I particularly feel like being sued. It's all public, but you know, whatever. Um, here's an example of a company. Yeah, there's a lot of startups going on at the moment. This one's come up with NFTs, you know, basically non-fungible tokens for biodiversity as a way of catalyzing investment, yada, yada, yada. They've said, well, we don't like offsets. They don't work. Okay, cool, great. Nevertheless, we're coming out with a product that could be used as an offset and we're designing it for this purpose because we know we expect decision makers to still use them. And I've said, hang on, sorry, you're designing a product that you know will be misused, but you're bringing the product online anyway. Have I got that right? Well, we can't control how people might use these things, but we still think this is better than nothing. This is still, you know, we just got to try to do something good. Sounds a little bit like, look at this lovely gizmo. Isn't it sweet? Has anyone seen Gremlins? Just don't, you got to use it and not keep it, you know, keep it away from water. Okay. Be careful. So, yeah, I'm pretty angry at the moment. I, I, I oscillate between blind anger, which is where I am today, and crippling depression, um, which is where I am most of the time. But this shit really makes me angry that we are accepting this nonsense in the face of an emergency. Okay. Okay. I said I was going to give you four reasons why the nature of repair market bill sucks. I've got a lot more. I'm only going to talk about two of them um, because I don't have time. Uh, but you can read my whole thing on my website if you choose. So drawing on from the previous discussion, this bill will enable inadequate compensation or offsetting through the issuance of these certificates that it will generate or create. I do need to talk about definitions a bit though. So the Nature Repair Market Bill aims to create personal property in the form of a biodiversity certificate. This is a new thing, other than in the last six months we've seen all those UN stuff come out. So a certificate by certification that something has occurred. You have planted some trees, you have put a fence there. We are quite sure that is a positive thing. Congratulations. Here's a mark to signify that you've done something positive. We only really, really care that something's positive happened. We're not, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we're not, we don't care exactly if all of those trees survive. We just know it's generally at a scheme level, it's going to do something good. So, you know, we're not trading it. We're not, you know, we're not planting that tree and then using that as an offset. So we don't need to know exactly. We don't 
need to spend all of those transaction costs knowing that those all of those trees have spied. They are quite literally NFTs. They are non-fungible. They are location specific. One certificate is issued per project, per site. Those sites can be wildly different. It made sense under the Little Crowd scheme because he was proposing to use them. And you don't even need a certificate. You just need to mark on the carbon offset registry that it's this kind of project and there's some cool trees there. So someone purchasing a carbon credit can know that it's coming from this kind of project, not that kind of project. We want to see trees, this species of tree rather than that species of tree. Cool, I'm going to pay a bit more for that because I like that species or this type of ecosystem, whatever. They can't credibly be used to offset or compensate for a loss elsewhere because they don't show a measurable gain. They're non-functional. They are location specific. Um, if you're asking, yes, ENGOs have already tried to do NFTs and NFT Bro on LinkedIn was is also doing that. Um, we and you know crypto community. Oh no, don't have the crypto community. But you know this this is yeah. This is not an unrealistic thing. A credit is very different. Um, this is from Martin's and I's paper from 2015, where we're talking about we're actually measuring a biodiversity gain relative to a counterfactual scenario. We're getting this benefit relative to what would have happened in absence of doing that activity. We've quantified it, we've measured it. Uh, a credit, you know, usually. It's like for like and assumed fungible within a species or ecosystems. Yes, biodiversity itself, you know, we can't make it fungible, but for the purposes of offsetting, we have these trade-offs. There's usually multiple issuances, at least in the carbon market, multiple issuances of credits over time. As trees grow and as carbon is sequestered, um, we sequester more carbon. So we're going to issue you more credits to demonstrate that that's happened. And, you know, so the more a project sequesters carbon, the more valuable it is, right? So that in itself makes it very, very different. That's a more liquid, fungible commodity market compared to a essentially an art sale. You know, we're selling one unique thing very different kinds of buyers, very different markets. Um, they can credibly, if used properly, et cetera, et cetera, use to compensate for a loss. And, you know, we've got that in the New South Wales um, biodiversity credit market already. But, so here's, you know, back in August last year, on the same day that the media released for the Prime Minister announced the creation of biodiversity certificate scheme, the Prime Minister tweeted saying, this is a credit scheme. Sounds the same, they both start with C. Uh, July last year at the Biodiversity Offsets Conference that Martina and I were at, I am so excited about nature credits. Uh, this one here, September, uh, certificate credits. And now she's talking about certificates. All right. So everyone's heard about this cool credit stuff, really excited about credits. The bill that they're doing a control C, control B is certificates. It's quite literally trying to shove a square peg in a round hole. It doesn't matter how much you want a liquid fungible credit market with lots of buyers and sellers. This is a certificate market that you're putting into parliament to pass, okay? This is really basic stuff that is completely just the, the mind boggles, okay? Brings me to my other point. It will incentivize projects that literally do nothing. Um, I'm speaking from experience from the carbon market. So you may or may not have been aware of some of the noise around this space. Um, my colleagues Andrew and, and Don have been leading the charge with this. Um, we've had an independent review. Chubb says we're serious people, that's nice. Um, 
I'll talk just briefly about one of the methods under the Emissions Reduction Fund. So it's one called HIR. It's shortened to human-induced regeneration, but the full name is really important. It's human-induced regeneration of a permanent, even aged, native forest. Who works on forest mapping veg stuff? I know Hannah does. What's the Kyoto definition of a forest? <laughs> It varies. It varies. Nation Are we talking about stuff that's this high? Um, what about this high? Yeah. This high? It's going to be more than two metres. Yeah. 40% ground cover, I think. Okay. So we're talking about something that's kind of at least up here. Can we get those kinds of forests in the desert? No? Oh my God. Okay. So this is a really popular project. This is what a project is meant to look like. We are regenerating a permanent, even age native forest from something that's being cleared in the past. Okay? Even aged, what does that tell you? It's growing from the same time point, meaning there's been some clearing events, right? So if we regenerate forests from a project that looks like this and then ends like this, great. Love it, love to see it. Cost effective, cheaper than planting trees, ecologically relevant for the context, good for biodiversity, love it. Want more of these projects. Most of them look like this. Okay. What's going on here? These are where all of these projects are. Gray is remnant uncleared vegetation. White is where clearing has occurred. Pink is where we're regenerating permanent even age native forests. Anyone wanna yell out reactions? Boo. Go for it. That's it, boo. Boo. <laughs> boo. Reaction. Um, can, can we get two meters high forest here? We can get woodlands. No. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's just the West Australian stuff, you know. Has there been extensive clearing here? What, what about here? Here? Uh, a few years ago, uh, economist Paul Burke at ANU called this out. He was actually calling out this stuff here. Uh, actually more, because this is where more the avoided, no, here. This is where the avoided clearing stuff is. So up here is where we're paying people to grow trees that already exist. Here is where we're paying people to not clear trees that they never plan to clear. So Paul was calling out these ones here, which aren't showing this map, but he's called this, this is the problem of adverse selection where the incentive structures that we put in place incentivize low quality projects that would have happened anyway. It is the lemons problem. It's what happens when you go and buy a used car. Used car salesman always knows more information about that car than you do. Asymmetric information. And it's played out on a massive scale. But this is fine, it's fine. It's essentially sound. We just had the findings of a six month review that said that it's essentially sound. Um, essentially sound, but made numerous recommendations to improve the scheme. I don't know why you'd need recommendations to improve the scheme, improve the scheme if it's already essentially sound, but nevertheless. Um, didn't examine individual projects, and Professor Chubb has come out variously in recent days in the last couple of weeks to say we weren't asked to do that. So, okay, didn't look at this map, I guess. I don't know, didn't have a computer on on board. Um, we've got into detail in some recent papers. You can read them if you want. I don't have time to go into too much detail. It's very easy to get sucked into so many details here um, uh, because we're in this constant debate at the moment and even the Carbon Market Institute Carbon Offset Lobby Group came out yesterday saying, well, it's just very, very hard. This data is really, really complex. 
And um, even if you look at a site and there's trees there, it doesn't mean anything. You need to know, you need to do a LIDAR, you need to, all of this data that you, the public, can't access. It's very hard to know. And any analyses that might come out in the future, which analyze, analyze these data a bit more, it's likely to be wrong. Okay, I guess we'll just shut up then. Um, what's the safeguard mechanism? I'm kind of coming to the end of my rant. This is currently being debated and negotiated. The government tried to get it through Parliament recently and didn't get through. Um, this is the policy which aims to keep Australia's largest greenhouse gas emitters uh, to a limit, to a baseline, to a cap. Government seeking to amend the safeguard mechanism to deliver about 200 megatons of abatement as a way of meeting a small portion of our climate targets. The key problem at the moment is that 100% of that abatement could be delivered by carbon offsets. A lot of them from here. There's only one other country in the world that allows 100% of, of the, that kind of abatement to be delivered by offsets, and it's Kazakhstan. Most other nations, the maximum is about 25%. I think there's some European countries where only 5% of that abatement could be delivered for offsets. So if you're delivering abatement through offsets, you're not actually making real reductions. We crunched the numbers. About 50% of that 200 megatons abatement, uh, this is a conservative estimate, about half of this abatement could be delivered by low integrity, high risk offsets from those human induced regen projects, as well as a couple of others, avoided re deforestation and landfill gas. All of these are existing projects that are currently issuing ACUs or you know, having ACUs issued. Um, there's no plans for any of those ACUs to be blocked from use. Um, people can still buy them, even with the Chubb review recommendations. Um, bit of perspective, this is the proposed abatement under the safeguard mechanism. Uh, this is scope three, three as well, but you can see that even that abatement under the safeguard mechanism that's being debated is still tiny relative to the amount of emissions that we have on the line to come through from new coal and gas projects that the government wants to get through when the IPC, IPCC came out today, again, saying we cannot have new coal and gas. Um, there's a National Press Club address going on at the moment by the chair of the Carbon Market Institute, who was on Radio National this morning, saying, oh, well, if we stop new coal and gas, you know, that all the power will go out. People won't, Australians won't have electricity or hot water. New coal and gas most of which we're exporting, okay? Um, this is going to give me nightmares. Um, yeah, so we're, we're up Ship Creek. This was from the new IPCC report today. So we're in a situation where uh, arguments being put forward saying we can't actually have new coal and gas in line with the science. You're not really being realistic. You're not being reasonable. Stop being shrill. Um, coming back to safeguard and all those uh, carbon offsets, the integrity issues, uh, we were, a few of us were in this Senate inquiry a few weeks ago. This was when the first time a safeguard mechanism bill would try to get through Parliament. Um, both the Department, Federal Department of the Environment, and the independent regulators said that the Trump review recommendations only apply to new projects going forward new carbon offset projects going forward. The integrity for existing ACUs is fine. There isn't any issue with any of the ACUs already in circulation. But three weeks earlier, they said on a public webinar, the recommendations apply to all projects, new and existing projects. Why has there been a change in tune? Could it possibly be due to the number of offsets that are currently in circulation that would be available for purchase to enable meeting our safeguard liabilities? It's all up in the air at the moment. 
Um, I didn't want this to be a fully depressing, you know, cascading disaster. But, you know, I'm in a privileged position where I have a relatively stable, secure job. Just got another five years. Woo. Woo. Um, I feel an obligation to call this call this out. What? I nearly said it. <laughs> I nearly said it. Um, I nearly said a swear. Uh, all of this together, if I were to say. Well, you know, it's got some merits and, you know, we just need to, like, try a bit harder to, you know, get a bit more improvements. I would be complicit in enabling a bullshit, terrible policy. Um, so that's why I'm being very blunt today. Um the likely future, and I'm very happy to take bets on this, the likely future of the nature of hair market is that it will fail to reverse biodiversity loss in Australia. And look, people say, well, that's fine because that's not the purpose of the market. The purpose of the market is to unlock private finance. So what? What does that mean? Um, it's likely to incentivize projects that do nothing, especially given that all signs point to uh, the intention for certificates, which aren't meant to be traded or used to compensate or offset things, to use it for that purpose anyway, in exchange for more biodiversity loss that's going to occur from all of the coal and gas projects that the government wants to put through. It's a distraction. Um, we hear, oh, but this isn't meant to, like, you know, displace all of these other things. Well, of course it is, because I've just given a talk about it. I could have given a talk about, you know, EPBC reform, but instead this is what we're talking about because that is the policy agenda that has been set. So uh, I don't want to be complicit in, I've given it air, I have given the agenda of air through this talk, but I hope um, this is some food for thought at least. I go into more detail about all the safeguard mechanism shenanigans in this Twitter thread. Um, you can email me, yell at me later. Or now, we've got 20 minutes. <laughs> Well, it's just interesting because, like, bad markets, nobody's got any confidence in them and it won't generate finance anyway under those circumstances, right? Because if nobody's got confidence in the market because everybody thinks that the credits are nonsense, then it's sort of, like, it's corrosive, right? So I'm interested in that that would have been a discussion instead of cleaning it up, right, which would – or really working hard to – provide evidence that they were trying to clean up that bogus stuff, right? Because bogus stuff just means you de you destabilise the market. And so yeah. I don't really, I sort of don't understand, you know, what the what the thinking is. is. Is the thinking that if we just, like, lift up the rubbish and, and everybody will forget what's going on? Or... Yeah, look, great question, Kevin, and I, I, I can't comment on the whether there's a grand strategy behind I don't necessarily think there's necessarily grand strategy particularly given the you know credit certificate confusion but your comment about how all of these rubbish credits and rubbish projects detracts you know for, even from market sense forget everything else if the price is kept artificially low by these low cost, low integrity projects where we're purportedly regrowing lost forests in the desert that you can buy for $20, $30 a tonne, I think the spot price is about $35, $37 at the moment, 
how much would it cost to restore a uh, um, pond of pasture? Yeah, it's a whole lot more, and you know, the carbon credits aren't worth it then. So it's sort of like it's like undermining good projects to do this sort of stuff. Yeah. It's undermining good projects as that price is kept low. Projects that are actually going to deliver biodiversity, you know, really good biodiversity outcomes. All the stuff that we, all the places where we wanted these projects to go. Yeah, they're delivering carbon abatement that someone might buy to offset their emissions. Yeah, we need to accept that as well. But we wanted these projects to go in here. We wanted them to restore the brigolo. We wanted them to uh, restore um, mangroves. That costs more than $35 a ton of CO2 equivalent. While those projects are still coming online, those good projects are not getting financed. So even from a market perspective, it doesn't make any sense. It makes sense for those beneficiaries who have the market share Comments, questions, screams. Thanks for that. Um, I one of the very concerns I work in the marine space and marine conservation just takes things from land and tries to make it work in the ocean, which doesn't work. So if it's already this bad on land, that's like a very bad sign for, for what's gonna happen in the ocean. Um, but I was my question is about um the roof. So I'm a bit confused because I haven't followed this. I haven't followed this on land very closely at all. So are they reviewing? So the the proposal is for biodiversity offset market. But are they? You were talking about the the carbon market. Are they? What's So are they also reviewing that or changing that or is that just like something that's happening in the background while they're recycling it for the biodiversity? So the proposal for a nature repair market came online before that shop review was concluded. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, this bill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that doesn't take into account any of the shop review recommendations anyway. Okay. Um. So there are pre-existing issues within the Carbon Climate Initiative Act, which have been replicated in this exposure bill that the Trump Review has said recommended uh, ought to change. Um, a, one example is that a method that um, is used like the HIR method or a validity authorization method, a method to be developed to you know, generate certificates could be made um, without it meeting the biodiversity integrity standards based in the wording in the draft exposure bill. Just legally stuff like that, which undermine the whole thing. Um, also in the bill, a certificate can be issued to a project if the regulator is satisfied that a biodiversity outcome is likely. Regulator. And who's the regulator? The clean energy regulator, who is famously known for right. being involved in biodiversity conservation. <laughs> so uh, one of the recommendations that I and many others are saying is that maybe get the independent environmental protection authority that Labor has committed to establish to administer the nature of Canada. In your opinion or knowledge, which where in the world have they done biodiversity credits or carbon credits the best? Like, is there an yes. example that Australia should be looking at? We are the example, really. Um, no, not this one. If you go to, I think it's this one, or I think it's actually this one, the Jeff one. It actually calls our biodiversity offset market successful. Try. Try. Oh, it's just the whole thing, Martine. Um, yeah, it, we have we've had state level and territory level, you know, compliance biodiversity offset 
markets for the last 20 years. Um, uh, it's successful because they're in place. That's been the case with offset markets. You know, Australia's always seen as a leader because we've been doing it for the longest, not whether or not they're actually working or not, because you can't evaluate whether they're working or not because the data's never available, publicly available. And even if it was, if we analyse it, it'd probably be wrong based on what we're hearing this week. See how it's just like, it just gets stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to understand better um, what about a HIR, like so the human induced regeneration of a permanent divination? Yeah. What, what about that is biodiverse? Like, that's true. In this statement, it's <laughs> like, doesn't like, if it was like aerial views, it's what, what about? those three generation programs ensure biodiversity. It's not measured or reported on specifically. There's like biodiversity credits for a non-biodiverse plant. So to be clear, these projects are generating carbon mm -hmm. credits. Um, a carbon and a biodiversity project could co-occur in the same location and a certificate method could in a parallel sense, monitor, well, report on what kind of biodiversity outcomes would come from those projects as well. But at the moment, it's just, you know, we've been talking about we need to report on the co-benefits from these, you know, biodiversity, social, whatever, co-benefits of these carbon projects. You know, it wouldn't be hard. You can just add a couple of comment columns on the current carbon register saying, yeah, it's got these things. But instead, we're introducing a new bill to Parliament to create a whole new market. Like it's, it's, it's like you know a Ferrari for a you know matchbox car kind of problem. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, yeah, it's it's all part of yeah. It's these are natural climate solutions. These are nature based solutions. These are biodiverse carbon projects these are doesn't matter what you call it it's this is what we're doing it's just yeah it's weak um a bunch of hands just went up <laughs> have, 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 I've spoken to oh. a couple of times but yes oh no I just want to because Vera does that right you do a project with Vera and then they've got an extra methodology sitting on the side for biodiversity yeah you know. and they're coming out with their credits soon uh, but that's been going for quite some time not just there November 22 and just has any I mean Vera's also you know been uh criticized yeah <laughs> <laughs> been in the literature for actually a long time their problem with carbon credits but I wondered whether somebody had analyzed whether the biodiversity parts have actually been delivered on better than perhaps the carbon credits or that I think they're more than biodiversity it's I know the number of the method but I haven't actually I can't remember yeah. the, the, the the bit of time that I've spent looking at the co-benefit standards under Vera when I was back in Queensland government was that it's we saw a bird kind of situation. Yeah, so it's not very it's 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 also quite weak. That was a few years ago. Yeah. Um but yeah um there's a question over here. Yeah so that's what you said before. Does it mean that basically we could uh sell the uh, conserv cons conservation outcomes of carbon offset projects as outcome um, biodiversity credits that's the hope yeah. yeah okay so a lot of people that there's a lot of excitement about stacking we can stack some credits um martin's just holding her head um and that is oh we can sell the biodiversity benefits separately to the carbon it's like good good um carbon offset should include like positive externalities for nature and conservation yeah but if we sell that part, then the carbon credit becomes not as good. So. This is it, it. Everyone's excited excited about stacking because there's the potential to bring more finance into these projects and potentially move some of these projects east. But there's additionality issues. If you are doing the same action and being paid twice for that one action. 
that's just pure red sea. Yeah. Um, Kate. I have a question from the chat. Oh, Sam, yes. Sam Nickel. Um, <laughs> thanks for a great talk. Um, while I'm at it, thanks for a great talk from Jeremy, April, and Amanda. Oh. Um, Sam says, how much how much of this is sloppy enforcement versus bad policy? Could the carbon market be saved or is it fundamentally flawed? From your experience looking at this, do you have any ideas about how the private sector could more effectively be incentivized? to engage in biodiversity investment? Uh, there's a few in that. Um, it's not really, a, it's not a compliance and enforcement issue. It's a policy administration issue. The argument that my colleagues and I have put forward over and over again is that this method is being administered not in line with the intent. The Clean Energy Regulator is responsible for registering projects in these locations. That's a policy administration issue. It's not a compliance and enforcement issue. So it's not those farmers' fault. It's the regulator's responsibility to administer that method in line with its intent. And that is what the Chubb Review recommended that that method is administered in line with its intent, in line with what the regulation says. It's a, it's a legal instrument. We're still yet to hear whether that will happen. And it's worth noting that the Clean Energy Regulator is an independent statutory body that doesn't have to take direction from the minister. Okay. Um, what, what can private, what can we do We incentivize private, private finance? So I just last year I interviewed, did a bunch of interviews around this space, trying to get an idea of that question. And it kind of goes around in circles. It's, um, well, before we can really invest, we need better regulation from government. And usually financial players, when they say better regulation, they mean financial regulation. So superannuation, for example. Superannuation, uh, 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 companies have firms have an obligation to deliver X percentage financial returns to their members because of retirement savings. It is difficult to get an 8, 10, 15, 20% financial return on investment year by year on a biodiversity project or a carbon project. So that prevents that kind of institutional investment. So there's some saying those parameters or those benchmarks might need to be tweaked, but there's also the simple fact that, well, the financial return is the primary thing. They can't invest in something unless there is a positive financial return. And frankly, you know, it really just comes back to regulation, stopping, you know, it disincentivizing harm in the first place. And it just comes back to this boring old standard tools of government thing. None of this, you know, oh, innovative financial instruments. It's do your job, regulate, stop harm from happening in the first place. And when you disincentivize harm, you will therefore incentivize restoration. I'm looking really hard at you, Kate, but I know you didn't ask that question, but it's really getting into it. Um, Laura. Um, I'll agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I work with a lot of um, mining companies globally, essentially, who fully understand this issue and are trying scrambling to collect data and develop methods to actually yeah. do a good job to deliver a carbon project that actually comes out on top. And they know that they can't rely on governments to set up ways for them to do it. So, and they were committed to net positive, whatever that means, but they they know that they need new data and um, methods to do it. Um, so this, the industry to me, at least some of them, some of the big players seem to understand this issue. And so I guess I'm wondering like, do you, what do you think is happening? Like do governments, do they not get it? And, or uh, do they get it and they just don't care? And if they don't get it, like, what do we need to create and show them and tell them about to actually make them understand that this isn't working? Like, yeah. I feel like they've been saying it's not working for so long. I would love 
some of those companies to come out and say and demonstrate this is actually what they're doing. Because at the moment, all of the oxygen is taken up by the squeaky wheels who are kicking and screaming and trying to draw out their business model for as long as possible. A lot of these big companies get it and are freaking out and are getting on with it. But uh, they're not the ones that you see on LinkedIn posting about how they're starting their nature competitive journey. They are just getting on with it. Um, and it's actually, I, I found it really difficult. Like I think it is difficult for our community, our academic research community to connect with those who are do, getting on with that job because, you know, our communities generally don't talk. You know, it, it took me a couple of years in my career at DEPRA to really just uh, sound out that space. And even with the interviews I, I did, I didn't still didn't really get access to those kinds of people. It takes time to build that credibility and within, you know, to get in that space and to build those relationships and actually work with some of those companies. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a really great point that there are companies getting on with it, but the policy agenda is not being driven by them. It's being driven by those who want to maintain the status quo. What do they need? What do we need to show them to like change that? How do we convince them? Show who, show what commits. Do you make the regulator like? If I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah. Um, as I said before, it's devolving into ridiculousness. You know, there are open letters, there's, you know, snarky, it's, it's, you could spend all your time embroiled in this. And I guess one of the things I wanted to kind of say here is that I would love more people to be aware of these issues and involve themselves in whatever way makes sense for them. You all have different roles that you can play that can be behind the scenes. It can be working with corporates, it can be working with government, it can be, you know, shouting at the minister. Um, every role is valuable. Um, and there's no one way that's going to work. It's going to depend on what you feel you can do at any moment in time. And at the moment, I feel like I can shout and scream on, in this seminar. I'll probably go and lie in the field position next week and have a cry. Um, but, yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Can, can I just relate it to that? Because we get lost in the detail when this yeah. is not our area of expertise and go, oh, my God, this is too complicated. Is it decent? Is it green watching? Do you recommend, like, our top two talking points we should just show to the world appreciating that so really ambitious um what are we asking for in the bin a particular change what's in the, the bin just get in, in the bin get in the bin all of us um a big protest i mean i have personally i can only speak personally i have become a bit more vocal with you can't be approving new coal and gas projects. Well, it's just, you can call that unrealistic as much as you want. But, and I fear just as anyone that I'll be marginalized and, you know, called a loony and, you know, a shrill bloody young woman or whatever. Um, that's what I've personally been doing a little bit more, trying to be a little bit more brave. Not everyone's in the position that they can do that. Um, so keep your own prize. Like, what, what is the actual goal? Don't let the agenda be fully set by others. One quick one from Jeff Heard. Thanks, Megan. Greatly appreciate those insights. Wondering if we staged a coup tomorrow and put you on the top job, <laughs> just say the word. <laughs> What would be your ideal replacement policy for biodiversity conservation in Australia? Fix what we've got. We don't need new policies. 
Um, we have a piece of legislation where we've had two decadal reviews that says what is broken, what needs to be fixed. Just implement the Samuel Review recommendations and finance it, fund it. We're not going to have anything work properly if we starve it of resources. And that has, you know, nothing works properly because we need an order of magnitude more public finance into biodiversity conservation. And yeah, maybe that's unrealistic, but I'm still going to say it because if it's not said, then that policy window gets shifted further and further away from what we actually need. <laughs> We're at time, but yes, Claudia. <laughs> one quick question. Sure. Um, do you think the discourses about delaying action on climate change and biodiversity are changing in the last couple of years just because yeah. we are also seeing that? And there was an interesting paper maybe a year or two ago that came from Europe that was about discourses this about course, climate, climate delay. Climate. I want to do that paper on biodiversity. If anyone wants to work with me to write a paper and try to analyse and categorise and summarise discourses of biodiversity delay, biodiversity, whatever it is, um, I love because, yeah, you just see them everywhere now. Yeah, and I think they're changing too and they're proliferating. And I think it would be interesting to understand, well, how are those discourses different or similar according to what sector you're in, because I think there's some differences and there's also some context differences according to our sort of policy settings and what people perceive to be possible here rather than in Europe. So, yeah. I it's happening it's here. What it's, I mean, I, there was some kind of, um, I think France has entered into some kind of agreement or negotiating with a uh, government um, around biodiversity to be good as a way of injecting finance into you know, it's out. Mm -hmm. um, the exact same, oh, we don't have enough public money to save our biodiversity, so we need private finance. We're having it here. Australia is apparently too povo to protect its own biodiversity. Um, it's transferable <laughs> everywhere. The added difference with Global South is that they are going to be even worse off um, shouldering the risks of that transaction. You know, the whole de-risking debate or de-risking idea is that we remove those risks from the private sector and put them on the public. That's what de-risking means. Um, Public-private partnerships, all of that. So the global staff will bear that risk even more because it's, well, in exchange for tax relief, you know, here's a bit of money to save your biodiversity. Um, yeah, but you're right. Maybe we can challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.